Our first uh, speaker is uh, Mohammed Rezi uh, Moini, and uh, his uh, seminar or talk is on uh, build buildability, rheological real properties, and early age deformation of 3D printed uh, cement based materials. Mohammed uh, Reza is uh, yes, a professor at uh, Princeton University, and uh, he can proceed, I guess, uh, as soon as he's ready. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm excited to be here virtually, of course, uh, and talk to you a little bit about the two aspects, mainly buildability and rheological properties and the relationship. Um, and um, briefly on the early age deformations of 3D printed uh, cement based materials. Um, this is a work uh, conducted as part of my PhD at Purdue. Um, and um, in collaboration with, um, of course, my PhD advisors, uh, Dr. Oleg, who's over here at Youngblood, uh, and also with our uh, broader collaboration, um, Tennessee Tech and Vanderbilt University, Dr. Bernard and Dr. Sanchez. Uh, without further ado, let me begin. So uh, early age deformations in additively manufactured materials is uh, an intertwined um, issue. Uh, on one side, you have air layer deformations as you extrude the material. Uh, on another side, materials are viscoelastic and have uh, various rheological properties. And on the other side, um, you are looking into optimal and suitable fresh performances, one of which, of course, is buildability. But understanding um, the relationship between the, la the, the, the two um, ladder uh, can help us essentially reveal underlying deformation mechanism and control the fresh response. Now the question is uh, how early age deformation of material translates into deformation in 3D printing applications. There is a number of uh, approaches that have been addressed um, so far. Printability is a, is a multifaceted issue. Uh, the way, at least at this point, I think we can agree that um, the terms are relatively well defined, extrudability being the ability to extrude the material without interruption. Uh, buildability being the ability to extrude and retain the geometry and printability could be a combination of both, at least for the sake of this presentation. So many people from <coughs> ceramic community have looked into this uh, from a direct ink writing perspective on a smaller scale. And many others in the cement based community, many of which you will, many of which you will hear later on about, um, have also looked at exotropy, uh, open time processing parameters. Uh, testing and tribological effects. Uh, but let's focus on um, the, the buildability and printability aspects. Uh, there are also a number of works that looked into that have looked into the design of material such that we respond to the fresh performance in the ways that suits us uh, for printing applications. Uh, looking at rates of uh, the kinetics of hydration, design of the materials, um, and uh, the performances as you scale up from base to mortar to concrete. And another approach, uh, another, set, another set of literature uh, folks have, have looked into buildability and the failure mechanisms, uh, looking into a variety of analytical and modeling approaches or experimental methods to look at uh, the structural rate of structural buildup in the material um, and uh, the time dependent properties in the context of the rate at which we build the structures uh, and how they intersect and how can we control the hydration and rheology to control the fresh response. Those two mechanisms essentially have led to understanding that the yielding failures and buckling failures exist um, in these systems. They also refer to as plastic failure or elastic buckling or as elastic failure. Um, there is a still, uh, although we understand these systems from the way they fail, there is a still a lack of understanding, in my opinion, in terms of what is the relationship between the rheological properties and these mechanisms. So the question is that we ask is what rheological properties govern these the buildability and these mechanisms. And so to get to that question, uh, basically uh, you have three situations. You either cannot extrude um, in this case, or you can extrude, but your material fails at the lower layers. Um, uh, avoid, uh, preventing you from building up or um, as you build up, the failure still occurs at the bottom layers. Or you can have buckling in which the material essentially collapses on itself in one or 
another way of modes of failure, uh, the best of which is depicted um, in this video. Now, the objective here is to, again, understand the relationship between the early age biological properties and buildability. And I refer to early age because these systems, the most, in my opinion, most of the deformations occur in the first 30 minutes. And so, although over time, uh, the rate at which the hydration and rheological properties change is important, but most of these systems fail while they're being printed, which means they're, they're, they're failing in their first initial uh, 30, 30 minutes before uh, the, rise of, uh, the rise of shear moduli. And so what we hypothesize is that these shear moduli control the buckling behavior in these systems because uh, the buckling are related to elastic properties of material and shear moduli and elastic properties are intercorrelated. And so the method we use, we use a, a direct ink writing, a, a small scale to 3D print a hollow elements, and we define um, buildability by the height of the hollow cylinder. And we picked a hollow cylinder because it's one of the sensitive geometries to buckling. And so if you want to study buckling, you probably want to study a cylinder element. People are probably familiar with this uh, slicing have been used. And then we use the stress sweep from uh, less than from 0.1 uh, Pascal to uh, beyond materials yield the stress uh, using parallel plate within the same time frame at which we, the printing was, was being conducted. And we use a, high range, a, a wide range of admixtures to diversify uh, the range of rheological properties. Uh, but we also had to be able to print and build in order to study the system. So if you look at the buildability, we had plane systems in which we, um, uh, if you go essentially with solid contents higher than 56%, um, that translates into a water sense ratio of 0.25, you're essentially not extruded. Uh, you're, not be, you're not going to be able to extrude. Uh, and if you look at, uh, as, you, as you decrease your solid content to 53%, you would be able to extrude. These are nozzle sizes less than uh, two millimeter. Um, and then as you increase the solid, decrease the solid content or increase the water so you shoot 0.3.35, obviously you start having these yielding. So in these, most of these systems I'm gonna be looking, uh, talking about, we did have both buckling and yielding, but for the sake of the relationship, we focused on, uh, on buckling. So if you look at systems with admixtures, if you pick essentially, I'm gonna get to my laser pointer. If you take this system and start looking into this, uh, uh, systems with chemical admixtures, then you can start tailoring, uh, improving, or diversifying the buildability, uh, all of which demonstrate a buckling mechanism. Um, and same thing, you can take an unextrudable paste and start looking into um, designing the material for, for buildability and um, being able to build, but again, buckling becomes a dominant, uh, dominant failure um, as you overcome, obviously, extrudability and, and uh, yielding. And so both uh, failure mechanisms that we anticipated were observed. And now we particularly focus on the buckling buildability uh, or the buildability that, was, uh, that, that resulted in, in buckling eventually and its correlation with rheological properties. So given the rheology and buildability, now let's look at, let's just start looking into what, what happens when you start putting them together. Um, if you, Looking to shear module of all of these systems, I want you to focus on the, the blue envelope in which buckling uh, occurred. Obviously, yielding and extrudability doesn't matter because you don't end up building much. Um, and so in these systems, uh, shear module I demonstrated a relatively strong correlation. Um, and same thing happens with complex module, modules, um, although not as a strong, but and then same thing happens with uh, storage modules. Um, and so if you put them all together, you can see that all shear moduli, G, G star, G uh, should be G prime, demonstrate a strong correlation with buildability. That is of course um, not the case. Uh, I say of course, because I know it now, but um, that is not the case when you look at loss modules. Um, and so, G, G star G prime demonstrated a stronger correlation with buildability than loss modulus. Um, if you look at yield stress, so we're still looking at buildability versus 
these rheological properties. If you look at yield distress, yield strain, and complex viscosity, none of which, again, have any strong correlation, this is rather expected, and we can talk about the, the talk about why uh, do we see that. Um, but I also wanted to point out to another phenomenon. So you can correlate G with uh, shear, shear mod modulus with elastic modulus. You can do the same thing with G prime and G star, um, and you can start looking into uh, predicting the buildability from Euler, assuming that these materials act like a perfect cylinder uh, and uh, compare the, the buildability predicted from Euler with, with E. Um, if you start using different K for different, uh, different uh, boundary conditions, uh, they don't differ by much, but uh, you can also look into uh, ranking Gordon buckling, which does take into account yielding. Uh, and because the material does not, um, the buckling is not really depend on yield distress. Uh, the, the relationship is not very uh, is not very strong. Is not very strong. Um, you can also look at the measure of buildability versus E, which essentially shows the same correlations as we were showing with G. This is expected because although the material is viscoelastic, in this case, it is the elastic component of viscoelastic properties that is responsible for buildability, and so therefore you see the same relationships. Um, and of course, there is a relationship between the predicted and, and uh, measured buildability. However, um, the use of Euler results in over prediction because Euler is for a perfectly elastic material and these materials are not perfectly elastic, which goes back to why the, the correlation for G star, G prime and, and uh, G is high, but not is, is not as, you know, is only 60, 70, 60, 50 to 60%. Um, and so to summarize this part, um, what we find is that we can, um, we can begin to, the, 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 essentially the data is, is uh, inferring that the shear module I uh, represents a, a, stronger, um, a stronger relationship with buildability when buckling is the dominant failure mechanism. Um, and so again, in other words, when you have buckling, it, it's, you need to control the shear stiffness as opposed to yield stress. Although yield stress and shear moduli are uh, directly related to one another, um, the, 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 the buckling does not uh, depend again on yield stress because it's not a yield, a yield a failure phenomenon. Um, and overestimation suggests that there's also um, geometrical imperfections that we're not taking into account other than the mechanisms um, that we talked about. Am I getting the my two minute warning? Um, the, the overestimation is not only because uh, the material is not perfectly elastic, but it's because we have geometrical imperfections, some of which I'm sure you will hear later today. So the overall, I guess, contribution here is that if we are going to 3D print structures that are going to be cylinder, um, and if the material property responsible for those failures are going to be shear modula, there might be a way to control these rheological properties for shear modula more directly as opposed to yielding. Um, and um, I should probably mention that we completely ignore the time dependent properties because we're focusing in the first 30 minutes before the rise of the shear modula. Um, the other brief component that I'll mention, and I'll finish with this, is that we did talk about rheological properties and fresh performance. We did not talk about air-age deformations and how do we assess them. Um, in this case, if we can assess the air-age deformations, uh, we can begin to improve the design of materials uh, by making up direct observations. And so how can we develop those tests that are repeatable and scalable is the question. In this case, many people have looked into the self-weight of the material and how they uh, translate into elastic moduli and yield stress. Um, one of the methods that we developed was to look into an open span uh, printing over an isosceles triangle. Um, there are two things that happens here. One is that the mid span deflection or deflection over varied span length. The other, uh, which you can quantify using after the material is hardened. Um, the other thing that happens is that the shape of this uh, catenary, which is 
in this case, in, in fact, it's interesting to mention that it's, it's, it's correlated with arc cosine of, uh, of uh, it, it's, it's highly uh, correlated with, a, uh, as expected, the catenary, which follows the arc cosine. But you can use this method to start looking into inherent uh, deformations of the material um, or to study the, the solid like liquid like uh, viscoelastic properties as you take in and out different admixtures and try to formulate your material for uh, perfecting your, your uh, deformations. Um, and so you can put all the data together by looking at um, mid span reflection uh, over varied span length and look at the correlations. And the shapes, and there's a lot more into it, but I just wanted to mention briefly mention that and discuss that maybe later. Uh, and it could be a new tool to assess the shape holding characteristics of the material. The I'll just at the end, I just wanted to acknowledge the support of NSF on this project uh, and the Wise School of Civil Engineering. Um, and without further ado, uh, my last slide. Um, at Princeton, we work on a number of uh, different uh, problems related to design and manufacturing of these systems and uh, I'll be glad to uh, I'll be glad to speak to to everyone um, in this session uh, virtually um, thank you uh, I uh, for your presentation quite interesting uh, I would I have we have a couple questions here uh, the first one is uh, from Dimitri uh, phase he says as uh, G star and G prime are functions of stress or strain at which stress or strain did you determine the G star and G prime? Also, did you consider the evolution with time? Yeah, so I answer the second first. Uh, we did not consider the evolution with time. Uh, we focused on um, characterizing shear moduli at a certain time within the first 30 minutes. Uh, all, of, all of these data I showed was characterized with, at the same time the material were printed, which is about 20 minutes. Uh, the first one is which stress or strain did you determine? Yeah, so we looked at um, li uh, linear portion of this elastic region. So all of the data I showed is in the linear regime because things start to get complicated when we go to nonlinear regime. So before the G, G star, G prime, G del, G del prime start to uh, wind down, which is um, most people have characterized it as, as, uh, as you know, um, if they start to re if they start to uh, go down more than ten percent, that's where you begin to that's where you begin to uh, essentially characterize uh, your G. So within the linear issue. Okay, so we'll go to I'll go to the next uh, question in the chat. As different admixtures will influence the extrudability, will the buildability test influence the buildability test? Did I get that right? <laughs> yeah, for example, the extruded material mass of each layer may not be the same. How can you respond to this issue in your test? Yeah, so uh, over here, over here when we are looking at, so the way we can respond to this is to, we actually measured because we had all the volumetric CT data, we had all the volumes, we also had the density uh, of the material fresh and hardened. So we could actually quantify the mass and normalize the data uh, per mass, if, that's, if that sort of answers your question. Um, it doesn't change much. I should just mention that if once you normalize it, um, it doesn't, the difference between those filaments and their thickness and their mass is not significantly different between one another. And so normalize, you can normalize, but um, and we did, it, but it didn't affect uh, the data. Okay. Okay, very good. Uh, the next question, uh, what method uh, have you used for the rheological characterization, rotational or oscillator one? Uh, well, that's probably just, uh, that's just, uh, you're doing oscillation there to get G prime, G double prime, so forth, right? So correct. that's, it's not, it's not just a shear. Correct, it's, yeah. it's oscillator okay. reality. Yeah. yeah, of course, okay, so that's good. All right, then I have one more question here. What kind of extrusion did you use? Any pumping you used for printing? Um, no, so we used uh, syringe, loading the material into a syringe and extruding them onto the print bed, essentially. Um, this is cement paste, so we used a displacement control um, uh, extruder. Very good, thank you. 